We know the simple truth that from the day of the fall, man's life became a warfare. The soul tends upwards, while the body seeks to drag it downwards. In this warfare, this conflict between the soul and the flesh is not the battle of a few hours or a few days or even months, but the battle of a lifetime. It begins when you reach the age of reason and it ends only at that moment when the soul departs the body and enters into eternity. It is a war that we must fight and cannot escape if we wish to get to heaven. And yet, we think of that. We get a little discouraged, don't we, at the coming battles that we must fight. But yet, heaven is the prize of those who will fight manfully and perseveringly, day in and day out, to the end of their life. And this is a reward which does not disappoint. It is worth every effort in the spiritual battle. Today I had thought of speaking of divine providence. It's one of my favorite topics to preach on, but decided to go another route and to speak to you about the beginning stages of the spiritual life, the spiritual warfare, and to give you some practical advice in the hopes that it might help you to progress in holiness. For there are many souls who are well-intentioned, but never advance very far simply because they do not know where to begin, nor do they know where they're going, nor the speed at which they ought to travel. All of us know the simple command of our Lord, and this sums up our spiritual life. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and thy whole mind and all thy strength. It's a simple enough statement and one which is easy to understand. But the question that remains, that puzzles us, is where in the world do we begin? Where do we begin to love God? And how do we do it? Well, it all starts with knowledge, a knowledge of self and a knowledge of God. Unless you know something, you cannot love it. And the more you know God, the more you love Him. Beginners in the spiritual life, and by beginners I don't mean simply little children or converts, but those who are still in the lower parts of the spiritual life. They haven't yet advance to the the stages that the saints have reached, for example. So beginners in the spiritual life do possess some knowledge of themselves. They must know themselves if they are to progress spiritually. But this knowledge at first is very superficial. It's only surface level knowledge. But little by little, and only little by little, and very slowly, we begin to see the faults that we have in our soul. And then we begin little by little to see the new failings which we commit more or less deliberately and voluntarily. Now, if these souls, once they begin to know their faults, are generous, they will not seek to excuse themselves or to justify their faults, but rather to correct themselves. This is the beginning of the spiritual life. And God will, little by little, reveal your faults, your sinfulness, your spiritual poverty. And our Lord does not do that to discourage us. Remember the story of the curé of ours. He was a saint that he was, his main temptation was to discouragement and despair. That was his one great temptation in life. And one day he asked our Lord, Lord, reveal to me my faults and my sins. I want to see them. And so his prayer was answered. And he saw so many faults that he almost despaired. And again he prayed to our Lord, Lord, 
take them away. And our Lord did, and he received consolation. But our Lord does not show us our faults in order to discourage us. Rather, he wants us to see all of our faults in the light of God's infinite mercy, that despite all of our faults and our sins, God has still called us to the true faith. God still loves us despite all of the times that we have offended him, and he continues to call us to heaven. We must see all of our faults and sins in that light. If we don't, we will become discouraged. So the first thing that a beginner in the spiritual life should do is to know himself. How does he do this? He does it by a daily examination of conscience. One or two minutes in the evening is all it takes to examine what faults you have committed in the day. And then not only to just realize what your faults are, but to resolve with practical resolutions what you will do to overcome them. This is the knowledge of self. We often, the faults that exist in beginners are these, most commonly, and these are the ones that we particularly do not notice in ourselves. We notice them in others, for sure. For sure, and we almost can't overlook them in others. But we don't see them in ourselves. And the first one is an inordinate self-love. And as I said, it's oftentimes unconscious. It's not noticed by us. But every now and again, when we're reproached, when we're corrected, when we don't get our way, well, then that self-love comes to the surface. You blow up in anger or some other sin. Self-love is often what is the fault of beginners. To overcome that temptation, we ought to meditate on the quote of, of what our Lord said, Why seest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, and seest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Despite the faults, as I said already, despite the faults in the soul of the beginner, God loves him more than he can even imagine. But his love is not sentimental. God's love for us is strong and manly. For he asks for, from us very great sacrifices if the soul is to progress in the love of God. Now... This takes us away from the knowledge of self, now to the knowledge of God. What is the beginner's not depth of the knowledge of God? It is very dependent on sensible things. That's why it's so important for parents to fill their, their homes with holy images. When you pray the rosary, have some book with pictures of the mysteries that you can point to as you're praying each mystery and say, this is what we're supposed to be thinking about. We learn, we know God, we learn more about Him when we have a visual image, and we should use them. Pictures, holy cards, religious books with beautiful pictures. But then the beginner also knows God in the mirror of the natural world. We see all of creation, and if we are generous, the sight of creation will make us think of God. We'll raise our minds to the goodness of God. And even more so when we read the parables, the prodigal son, the lost sheep or the good shepherd, or today's gospel narration of how God cares for even the littlest of his creatures. All of these visual images help us to know God more so that we can love him more. And we should use them. So this is the second thing that we must do, is to learn to know God by means of these images, the studying of the parables and the holy pictures. Now, as I said, knowledge leads to love. The more or less we know something, the more capacity we have of either, either loving that object or hating it. You cannot love something that you do not know nor can you hate something that you do not know. 
But God is the one being that if we know him, we must love him. It is impossible to hate God if you know him. Those who hate God have a false idea of him. But knowledge of God leads to the love of God. And the more generous souls love God with a holy fear of sin, which causes them to avoid mortal sin and even deliberate venial sins by means of mortification of the senses. This is one of the things that especially converts to the faith. They tend right away to go to mortification and prayers, long prayers and, and harsh penances and uh, what not. Well, this is a sign a good sign that that soul has the beginnings of a very deep and willful love of God. It is a love that it goes far beyond words and sentiments to action. You must prove your love of God. But the temptation in beginners is to choose the wrong types of penances. This is very important to remember. We read the lives of the saints and we, we read about their all-night vigils and their, their fastings and their scourgings. And right away, even from the beginning of our spiritual life, those are the things that we want to do. But we shouldn't. It's not good for us. Those penances were oftentimes done only at the end of the lives of the saints. After they had made such great progress in the spiritual life that those things were good. But for the ordinary Catholic beginning the spiritual life, such as you and I, well, those things are not very good for us. In fact, they are bad. That is the reason why so many Catholics who start out so fervent, so enthusiastically in the performance of their penances and prayers and they come to daily Mass and uh, say their daily rosary and, and all of the rest, well, they eventually become fatigued and eventually they lose all enthusiasm and they end by turning away from the spiritual life and often giving up their faith. And it is all because they didn't know where to begin with their penances and with their prayers. But if the soul is generous and really wants to become holy as God wants him to be, the soul will be patient, patient with himself. That's not something that we often think of, is it? Whenever we sin, we beat ourselves up for it and become discouraged and whatnot. Well, patience in the spiritual life is key. You don't want to go any faster than the grace of God wants to take you. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for a fall. It's like a little child learning to roller skate. He holds on to mommy's hand and she takes him really slowly up the road and he just wants to go faster and faster and eventually he falls flat on his face. That is how it is in the spiritual life. Don't go faster than the grace of God wants to take you. Also, to be obedient to the counsels of your confessor in regards to the spiritual life. If you do this and are obedient and patient, then God will usually reward you with great consolations. When you say your prayers, you'll experience consolation. When you do your penances, there is a certain sweetness in performing them. This is how God draws the soul further in the spiritual life. I think a good analogy would be a child raising, or rather a parent raising the child. Sometimes it's the other way around, but we won't say that right now. But a, ch a child being raised by his parent, when they're little, you have to reward them. You say, if you be good today, I'll give you this piece of candy. You reward them with it afterwards. And it, it gets them to do more and more. Eventually, they have to stop that. They don't want them to do good works just to, to be rewarded anymore. They want them to do good works because they're supposed to. And so God, he gives us this, this candy, this sweetness and consolation in the spiritual life. But then we begin to get older and grow in the spiritual life. 
It takes them away from us. We can't get discouraged at that point. This is a point in the spiritual life when many people fall away. They think to themselves, well, all these years I've been praying, it's always consoled me. Now all of a sudden, I'm full of aridity and dryness and my prayers are more of a penance than anything and, and I don't feel like doing my penances either. Well, perhaps God is removing them because you're no longer a child but an adolescent in the spiritual life. You are entering into that stage when at first you are in the act of purification, now you're entering into the passive purification. Don't let those words confuse you, it's very simple. We actively purify our souls of sin and their faults by willfully performing penances that we choose for ourselves. But when we have, go through passive purification, we allow God to, do, to give us all of the penances. He will take those consolations away. We must simply endure if we wish to progress in the spiritual life. Here is where a second conversion is necessary. Did you know that you can actually commit gluttony of the soul? We all know that you can commit gluttony of the body by eating and drinking too much or enjoying your food way too much. We commit spiritual gluttony when we, in, when we set too much, we pay too much attention and focus only on the consolations of God. We enjoy our prayer because we're consoled and we have this sweet feeling rather than to pray for the sake of God. And that is a sort of spiritual gluttony. And God cures us of this by taking those consolations away. And this is the second conversion in the spiritual life. This period, as I said, this period of dryness in the spiritual life is okay if you still have the, the desire, a strong desire of pleasing Almighty God and avo avoiding sin. If you don't have that, then it's a bad sign, a sign that you are becoming lukewarm. If you, when you pray, you feel dry, and you no longer have that desire to serve God. That's a bad sign. But if you're dry in the soul, but still want to please God, and still avoid sin, that is a sign that you are being led by God, and you must remain patient until He's done with His work. So, practically speaking, it is imperative that you have, that all of us have and possess a great generosity in this stage of the spiritual life. We must be generous if we want to advance and not to fall back into the life of sin. Our Lord said in one of his Gospels, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have their fill. And St. Thomas Aquinas commented on these words and explained them. He says, The Lord wishes us to thirst after that justice, which consists in giving to every man and to God, first of all, what is his due. He wishes us never to be filled on earth, but rather that our desire for holiness and justice should grow always. Blessed are they that have this insatiable desire, they will receive eternal life, and here below they will receive an abundance of spiritual goods in the accomplishment of the precepts. If you love me, our Lord says, keep my commandments. God does not want to force you into service, but he loveth, as the scriptures say, a cheerful giver. We must then, we must think of this. We must thirst for virtue. We must be generous in our penances, in our prayers. We must be generous with God. And we must be actually obsessed with the idea of heaven and with the idea, the thought of loving God above every other creature on the face of the earth. You must be obsessed so that that thought enters into every other aspect of our life, whether in the work place, or at home, or in private, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, that thought 
should, you should be obsessed with that thought. It should be the guiding star of, the, of your life. St. Thomas, when he was asked, what must I do to become a saint? He said very simply, you must will it. If you do not will it, you will not become a saint. I think of businessmen. I meet quite a few of them in the airports in my travels. And you can usually tell the more successful ones from the less successful ones. And people like Bill Gates, they didn't make it to where they are by a half-hearted willingness to sacrifice. No, they were dedicated men. In every aspect of their life, they worked at it and they worked at it and they never gave up. Their will was firm and they always went after what they wanted. You don't get a successful businessman by going halfway, nor do you get a saint by compromise. If you want to become a saint, you must will it with your whole heart, and you must go after it in the most generous way. This is the virtue of magnanimity, by the way. To explain what that is, he who is magnanimous seeks great things. He has his mind on high things, great things, worthy of honor, but he realizes, too, that honors in themselves are nothing. But the magnanimous man does not allow himself to be conquered by difficulties, nor puffed up by pride or by his successes. And there is nothing on earth, no honor that is greater on earth than genuine holiness. It is the greatest honor on earth. And the magnanimous soul does not fear obstacles in attaining sanctity. He does not fear his critics, what they will say, what they will think, how they will judge them. They do not fear mockery. And if by nature they do fear these things, they will be generous in overcoming themselves. And they will seek in all things to please God. For it says, no man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Life is a warfare we must constantly be gaining ground. Think of the generals in, in war. Brave generals always pushed their troops forward to gain ground. Never let them come back. They always push forward. So we should be doing in the spiritual life. So finally to summarize, what is it that we must do in the spiritual life to progress? First, to know ourselves and our faults. We do this by means of examining our conscience every day. We know we must know God. We learn about God through His parables and uh, through spiritual reading. Then we must love God. How do we, how do we love God? Not by mere sentiment or by mere thoughts, but in thought or rather in deed and in action, we must love him by performing our penances cheerfully. But the right types of penance that help us to overcome our predominant fault. And so let us ask Our Lady to give us this great generosity in the spiritual life. And yet, when we fall, let us remember today's gospel, how God takes care of even the birds of the air. And when they fall to the ground, it says, does not our Lord notice when we fall to the ground flat on our face in the spiritual life? God knows, and God will come, and by his grace will lift us up. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.